uh, sorry, my mic don't give me some information. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for welcoming uh, welcome today at the, the Product People Community event. Uh, we, we're going to start. And as Master mentioned, if you want to turn off your camera, please do, because this, this, this event will be re recorded live. Uh, so today's uh, topic is product led growth with the co-founder of uh, Userflow. But first of all, let me introduce myself. I am Lisa Cantamessa and will be your host for today. I have experience in uh, communication science. And uh, as for as the scenes of February, I've been joining product people at the beginning as an intern and later I got, a, got another the promotion as associate product manager. Uh, first of all, what do we do with product people? We help company discover and deliver great product faster, but how we do that? First of all, we do thanks to you, to our community that at the moment is more than 6K members. So really thank you all from all platforms that you are joining us. You're helping us grow and bring around the, the product uh, world. But we are also um, a company who do interim um, engagement. And uh, we do from a basis from three to 36 months. And we are really, we really like to onboard fast, align teams and deliver outcomes in a good and fast way. So how we do that, um, typically uh, we, we tend to help companies in this scenario for example, you got foundings and you need your product team to grow or one of your product manager is on a parental leave and we can help you there. But we can we have also have helped company when their previous PM was leaving and you need to hire in someone new and sometimes are in the perfect person takes some time. We also help during a more temporary initiative something is important or, new or urgent, we are more than happy to help. And we also provide some advice for your product team and process. Uh, so uh, as you can see, we've been working with uh, different clients. Uh, some may know more uh, around Berlin, but some also famous in Barcelona as well. Uh, we also have been working with B2B client, uh, maybe not so known, but important as well. And as you can see, this is our team. We are almost around 20 people between interns and product managers. And at the moment, if you would like to be part of this screen, you could because we are actually hiring. We are hiring a product manager or a talent acquisition manager. So if you think you are a perfect fit for this role or you know someone who will be, please don't hesitate to connect with us at productpeople.join.com. Um, but with further ado, I'm really happy to welcome our guest tonight. Esben is the co-founder and chief growth officer at Userflow, but he previously worked in Cobalt.io and Accenture. And uh, so, but I'm really happy to welcome him. But before starting, we have uh, a little poll for today's, and I would like to know your, your experience. Uh, if you are on Zoom, please respond through the poll Mansur will share with you shortly. If you are on, uh, on all the other stream platform like YouTube, uh, LinkedIn or Twitch, please answer in the comment. So what we would like to know and for, to help us and discover more about how will be the talk today is, do you work in a product-led environment? Yes, no. And then we want your opinion. Uh, with multiple choice. So product-led growth is, in, is a main driver of, could be acquisition, activation, revenue, retention, and referral. I'm really curious to see your, uh, your comment. Okay, let me check. Okay, so let's see. I see someone is already responding. Let's uh, let's wait a bit more. Okay. I don't hesitate to, to respond. We will 
we're really happy to see your, uh, your response. And keep in mind that for the second question, you may have more than one answer. Uh, okay. Um, I don't know, Mansu, do you want to give us a few more time for response? Okay, so I personally, I will say yes, we work in a product lab environment, a, pr a product people is what we do. <laughs> and thank you, Mansu, for showing the results. Okay, so we, most of you do as well. That's nice to know. And product led growth is a main driver of acquisition first and retention second. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing this insight. And uh, I will now leave the stage to, um, to, to the speaker. You can now present your screen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elisa, for, for that uh, introduction. And thanks for doing the poll. Uh, very interesting to see. I think we have a very mixed audience of people who are not in the product-led environment, people who are maybe thinking about it and some who already say they are. Uh, I'm always, uh, there are a lot of companies that say they are, but are they really? Uh, that's also the other question one could ask. Um, and then um, uh, also interesting to see how uh, people answered around where product-led growth fits. I think it, I agree, actually, when you saw the distribution of answers, it's very uh, distributed and it is because product -led growth is not like one area of the business, it's the entire life cycle of the business. So I think uh, the answers are all right in many ways. But uh, let's let's start with the, the presentation here. I'll uh, share my screen and uh, let me know when uh, you see, it. you should be seeing it soon. I'll just do go full screen here. So great. Um, so let's uh, uh, get started here. Um, so first of all, just to uh, further uh, introduce myself. So by the way, this is the talk I'm going to be doing uh, of, around product-led growth. Um, and I'm going to be speaking about some of my own experiences I've had with both uh, moving uh, from a sales-led to a product-led model, and then my experiences at my current company, uh, where we are born product-led uh, as a business. Um, to give some background on myself, then, uh, as, as mentioned, I'm one of the founders and chief growth officer at Userflow. Userflow is a platform that allows you to build in-app onboarding. So things like product tours, in-app checklists, and things like that. So you can guide your users to the, the famous aha moment. I'll talk more about that. Um, but basically a platform to allow customer success managers, product managers to build uh, in-app onboarding without needing developers. Um, prior to Userflow, I co-founded another company called Cobalt, uh, which is a security company, Pentest as a Service. Uh, it's today 200 plus employee company. Um, and as you can maybe hear by my accent, I'm, uh, I'm not American, I'm Danish, uh, but I've lived in the last eight years uh, in San Francisco, uh, in California. Uh, and you can uh, connect with me on LinkedIn or on Twitter uh, using these uh, links here. So that's short on me. Uh, and as mentioned, uh, at Userflow, we're very much a born product-led business. And with Cobalt, we actually went on a journey from being sales-led to becoming more product-led. Um, so, so I can speak to my experiences on both. But before we uh, look into that, uh, then let's talk about a bit uh, why product-led growth is happening in the first place. Um, so I have this nice picture here from uh, OpenView Partners uh, that uh, I think explains it in a, in a very good way. Um, so this is basically like a timeline of how software and especially B2B software has evolved uh, over the years um, and how the sales process uh, related to B2B soft software has evolved. So in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, all software was on-prem uh, kind of systems. Uh, it was typically sold to a CIO uh, because they owned the infrastructure and it was very expensive and it was very much this kind of traveling salesman uh, kind of uh, sales process uh, where you had physical meetings. 
Then in the 2000s, uh, companies like Salesforce came around to introduce this whole software as a service uh, model. Uh, and we moved into what OpenView calls the exec area, basically where you started, instead of selling to a CIO, you were selling directly to uh, business owners. So like VP of sales, VP of customer success, et cetera. Uh, so directly to the business functions. Software also moved to the cloud and it became more affordable. And more as software moved to the cloud, more of the sales process also moved uh, to phone calls or online meetings. And then over time, SaaS has kind of matured uh, to where uh, it is today, uh, where we have uh, what OpenView here calls the end user era, where the end users are making decisions on uh, what software to buy. Uh, and then they present it to the executives um software uh, is in the cloud and it's in very cheap cloud solutions which makes it very affordable and you can start doing things like freemium free trial etc uh, and b2b software is increasingly being sold uh, similar to how you sell b2c software uh, kind of like an e-commerce uh, self-service experience um, so SaaS has kind of matured from the early 2000s until today where end users have more power and people understand the SaaS model a lot more. And that is where this whole product-led growth comes in. Um, actually, before we, we move uh, into, into the definition of product growth, then there's this nice uh, numbers here from a 2015 Forrester report that actually says that uh, nearly 75% of B2B buyers says that they uh, buying from a website is more convenient than buying from a sales representative. And 93% say they prefer buying online rather than from a salesperson. So that proves this kind of end user error that we're in. So what is product-led growth then? Uh, so a lot of uh, you said you were already in a product-led uh, kind of uh, world uh, and some weren't, uh, but the way I define it is that it's a go-to-market strategy uh, where you always think product first. So in every part of your business, you should think, how could our product solve this? So everything from sales, customer success, uh, so the entire life cycle, as you showed, like trial, activation, retention, referral, et cetera. How could we actually get our product to solve this instead of hiring people? Another great way of understanding uh, what product-led growth is, is to look at the opposite, which is sales-led growth. So sales-led growth is where you hire uh, salespeople and customer success people to drive that entire process of uh, acquisition, activation, retention, et cetera. Um, having said that, uh, I still think there's room for salespeople and customer success people in a product-led world, uh, and I'll get back to that. Um, but yeah, that's a, a good way of thinking about it. So it's very much a mindset where you think, how could our product solve this? And you always think product first. The reason why uh, it has become uh, increasingly popular over the last years is that we've seen a lot of successful companies. Uh, these are just some of them, Slack, Zoom, uh, et cetera, uh, that has product-led motions and are, are being very successful with it. Uh, as an example, uh, you all know Zoom. We're on a Zoom meeting, uh, some of us right now. Uh, they have that model where consumers and like single users within a company can get a free version of Zoom and they can experience the uh, almost the full product um, and, and really uh, see the power of the product. And then they can start recommending it internally in their organization. And that has been a huge uh, growth avenue for Zoom. So that's just one example. Uh, what's in common for all these companies is they have some kind of freemium or free trial uh, kind of process. OpenView has made this nice list here uh, that shows that um, product-led growth companies in general seems to be outperforming other SaaS, com some SaaS companies in kind of key metrics such as value, revenue, and, and revenue growth rates. Um, so they are looking at a, a, a PLG index and they're seeing that PLG companies in general tend to grow faster than other SaaS companies um, uh, that appears on the public market. Um, 
So that's also, again, another interesting kind of motivator for looking closer at this whole product-led uh, growth movement. Another, uh, as mentioned, uh, to, to dive a bit deeper into product-led growth, uh, you, can, you can think of it if like the main difference is uh, to sales-led, right? Where you have humans in the funnel. So where you, in the traditional sales-led model, you have things like you request a demo, you always talk to a salesperson. There's like a contract, a PDF contract that needs to get signed. There's then when the users get onboarded, there's maybe like a customer success meeting with configuration, implementation, training, et cetera. Uh, whereas in a product-led motion, this new thing, you have self sign up, you have freemium free trial, you have online terms and conditions, you have automated onboarding, you have online documentation, online knowledge base, uh, and, and so on. Um, so so that's, that's kind of one way of looking at it. The other good way of looking at it is how you in a sales led model, this is how you used to do sales in a or how many businesses are still in SaaS doing sales in a sales led model is that a user visits the website, they sign up for a demo request, they have a qualification meeting with SDR, they then get passed to an account executive, they have a demo, they get sent a contract, and then uh, they negotiate back and forth. Maybe there's additional meetings, actually, there often are. Then they get onboarded with a customer success rep, and then the user gets to use the product. Whereas in a product-led motion, you're kind of switching that whole thing around and you're uh, also shortening down the cycle to only be the user visits the website, they sign up for a freemium or a free trial, they experience the value of the product, and then they buy uh, without potentially without speaking to everyone, anyone. So in that way, uh, by them seeing the product and experiencing the product um, uh, and that having that as the main kind of motivator for them buying, it, it gives a lot of benefits. One of them being that they've already seen the product, they experienced the product. So it's a lot more likely that they will not get disappointed with the product uh, later on. Whereas in the old sales led model, there's a higher risk of that actually. It's also a, a much less cost, costly uh, way of doing business, right? Uh, there's less need for people involved and you can significantly uh, reduce your, your cost um, in, in this process. So if you look at uh, the benefits of product-led growth, it's basically to empower this end user error that I talked about. It's to grow faster at scale. Uh, when you looked at those public companies that were uh, very successful growing in revenue, uh, it, it's, the er it's still early data. So uh, it's, you can, use it the way you like, but it, it, there's an early sign that companies tend to grow faster at scale when they have a PLG motion. Uh, and then you can, as, as I just mentioned, reduce uh, significantly the customer acquisition cost and customer service cost by reducing the need to have uh, humans in the funnel. And then the last one, which I think actually is the most important one, is that in a product-led growth world, the best products win. So uh, you cannot get away with having a bad product in a product-led world uh, because you're using your product as the main kind of sales mechanism. So you need to build the best product. And uh, that benefits all of us, right? Uh, in the end, uh, the end users benefit from getting great products instead of getting the product that had the best marketing or sales team to present something. Um, so I think that is the one I like the most, that uh, product-led growth leads to better products in, in general. So that was a, a bit of uh, general about uh, product-led growth. Uh, what I now want to speak a bit to is how you can actually um, become product-led. Um, and especially for companies that are maybe sales-led today. And, and I know some of you have said you're already in a product-led world. Uh, but at least my experience in Cobalt uh, was that we were in a kind of mix we had some product-led things, but we also very much had a, a large sales-led um, uh, kind of uh, movement. And we actually decided to, to move more, uh, try to move more towards the, the product-led motion. Um, is there any questions here on the chat? Uh, well, no, okay. Yeah, somebody's mixed too, that's great. 
Um, so uh, what I'm going to speak to a bit is, is especially how you move to product led when you're not born product led, but you have uh, like a, a sales led uh, motion today or, or heavily sales led company. And uh, for me, it's really about uh, primarily changing your culture. Uh, it's about changing this culture to think product first in everything you do. And it's for all the teams, right? It's for sales, it's for customer success, it's for marketing. Everybody needs to align towards the product and think product first if you want to be product led. Um, if, if you don't have that kind of culture change, then uh, I think it's going to be very hard uh, to, to, um, to become a product led company. So how do you actually change that culture? Well, uh, the number one thing is, of course, uh, that you need the management to buy into it. So you need to convince your executive management. It's not enough that it's just the product management function that is bought into this. You need to have your sales management, your customer success management, your marketing management, et cetera. All of them need to buy into this new product-led growth uh, motion. Uh, because again, otherwise they're going to work against you. Um, it's product-led growth is not a product initiative. It's a company-wide initiative. So it's very important to think about it like that. Then the second thing I think is super important is that you reduce your scope, um, but think big. Um, I've seen many companies that are sales-led trying to move to product-led that are overthinking everything. They are basically trying to make the perfect product-led motion from the beginning. And if you start th um, think about everything uh, you, and, and you put the scope uh, very, very big, you're never gonna get anywhere. One example of what we did at Cobalt was we reduced our scope uh, of product-led growth to only be focused on our smallest customers. So we basically said, okay, we're only gonna focus our product-led growth motion on uh, the SaaS SMB customers that we, that we had. And then we're gonna continue with a more sales-led motion for larger customers. In that way, uh, it became a more narrow scope and, and a more simple use case that we could think about and that helped a lot to move faster in, in this product-led change. Um, what we then also did was uh, we mapped out what is the desired user journey and kind of uh, compared it to the current user journey. Uh, there are many ways to do that. You can use things like Miro, uh, uh, Figma. Uh, in the beginning, we just actually had a spreadsheet where we compared, okay, we had uh, mapped out the entire user journey, how it was today, and then we thought about how can we make it more product-led? How can we make things self-service? How can we make uh, things automated? So you could technically do everything self-service as a customer. Um, that's like the essence of product-led growth is there shouldn't be a need to have humans in the funnel. You can still add them in as a nice to have, but there shouldn't be a need to have humans in the funnel. That's very important. Then uh, again, going back to this uh, don't uh, overscope thing, uh, really it's about also iterating, right? Do things, small changes, right? Like don't try to do everything at once. If you try to do everything at once, people get scared. It's a big change. Uh, people don't like big changes. Uh, so really do small iterations that move you forward and avoid uh, this kind of overanalyzing that you can sometimes end up with. Um, so I think that's super important as well. And then uh, the last thing here, um, uh, product-led growth is really a cross-functional initiative. Um, it's not, as mentioned, not just a product initiative. So it's very important you have cross-functional alignment that everybody is working towards the same goal. One way to do that, especially in a bigger organization, is to appoint some kind of uh, independent uh, project manager or somebody who's not biased towards anything, but still have enough management uh, kind of power to, uh, to drive certain actions. Um, so have some kind of a person who drives this initiative as a key strategic initiative within the business to drive the cross-functional alignment. Super important as well. So to summarize, uh, to change this culture to product first and, and become product-led, 
you need management buy-in, you need to reduce your scope, you need to map out your desired journey, you need to iterate to avoid overanalyzing, and you need to drive cross-functionally top and bottom. And it's funny, these are like, it could be anything that you wanted to change, but this is like a big thing. It's a big, big thing to move from sales led to product led. It's a lot bigger than many people think because you're in a software company and you think, yeah, it should be easy to move to product led growth. But actually, it's a big, big journey for a company that has traditionally been very sales led. Um, so, very important to keep this in mind. So that was a bit about uh, how uh, one, a bit about product-led growth and, and a bit about how you can move from sales-led to product-led growth. But now let's look a bit at some of the details involved in, in, in product-led growth and especially one of them, which is the aha moment. Um, the aha moment is really a key thing in product-led growth. Um, it's, it's basically a, a, a way to uh, get customers uh, to understand the power of your product. Um, if you look at a definition here of aha moment in the dictionary, it's a moment of sudden insight or discovery. In a product-led uh, world, it's the, it's the moment or moments when people discover this is a product I want to buy, this is a product I can get value from that I want to keep using. Um, and uh, to give some examples of uh, how different companies uh, are using aha moments. Um, so you can, let's start with Facebook, for instance. Uh, the aha moment in Facebook is, uh, I can see what my friends are up to. Uh, then you have Slack. I can easily communicate with my team and structure topics. And for user flow, our aha moment is that our customers discover that they can easily build good looking flows without needing developers. You can then tie these aha moment to some kind of uh, activation uh, kind of metric metrics. Uh, Facebook is famous for their, uh, if, a, if a user adds seven friends in 10 days, they know that they have experienced this value and they are much more likely to stay around. Uh, for Slack, it's when the team sent uh, 2000 messages combined, they know they have experienced this value of Slack uh, they've discovered this aha moment and they're more likely to stick around. And with user flow, we know they have experienced this uh, aha moment that they can easily build good looking flows when they spend more than 30 minutes in our app. One little thing we add to this is that they also need to be an ICP because it's fine that they spend 30 minutes in our product building flows. But if they are not able to, for instance, afford our product, then it's not a good customer anyway. So we also look at ICP. Uh, ICP is ideal customer profile for those who don't know it. Uh, so basically like who's your um, kind of, who, who is likely to buy your product. For us, it's SaaS businesses uh, above a certain uh, size. Um, so yeah. But how do you then actually get the users to this aha moment when you've defined it and you, you kind of realized uh, what it is? Um, uh, well, there are a couple of different things. So first of all, you need to give free access to your product. Uh, it can either be done via a freemium or a free trial. That's the most common kind of way of doing it. Uh, so give people the access to your product so they can see it. But uh, for very sales-led businesses, there can also be like iterative uh, kind of uh, solutions you can take where you kind of expose parts of your product to, to potential customers. In Userflow, uh, we made uh, a free trial. So we have a 14-day free trial and we actually made the free trial our primary call to action. We then made view a demo, our secondary call to action and book a demo is a touch area. So in, see that we are not even making book a demo a secondary call to action, which many do. Uh, we're making it a touch area. We're really trying to push people towards either doing a free trial with our product or viewing a demo of the product. So experience the product value before they talk to a salesperson. Then, when you uh, have given free access to the product, you of course need to identify what is your aha moment. Um, and the easiest way to do that is to ask your customers, uh, why did they buy? Uh, oft sometimes you have a really good idea of why they bought and so on, um, but get that qualitative data uh, from your customers. 
You can then combine that with quantitative data that you can get from tools like LogRocket, Heap, Amplitude, so analytics tools, or you can also look at things like Userflow. We also have simple analytics um, and of course, Clearbit for understanding what type of businesses is it. So there are many tools out there that you can use to analyze data as well. I want to uh, put in a caveat here that still remember to keep in mind, keep it simple. Don't try to overanalyze. Uh, for us, we really stuck to that one key uh, uh, kind of activation metrics, uh, which was uh, the spend 30 minutes building inside our product. Uh, we didn't try to like build very advanced formulas and stuff. Uh, if you start by doing that, I think it's going to be hard. Always start simple and then grow from there. Then uh, you should build onboarding that drives towards the aha. Uh, and for that, you can, for instance, use a tool like Userflow. Um, one uh, mistake that many companies do when they build onboarding, uh, and especially in-app onboarding, is they uh, kind of show, um, uh, or, or they tell instead of show. Uh, so basically, like, uh, they will give like product tours, where it's like, here's feature X, here's feature Y, here's feature C. And that's great, but that's not really what drives the user to a, a aha moment. You get the user to an aha moment by really driving them towards the right actions and letting them do those actions themselves. Uh, in our case, uh, our aha moment is that they can realize they can build a good looking flow easily. So our entire onboarding drives towards that. We drive them towards create a, creating a flow, uh, onboarding flow as quickly as possible. Uh, and then they realize, wow, I can do this. And that makes them want to buy uh, our product. Then uh, the last thing is you should remove any unnecessary friction. Uh, so you're, of course, trying to get rid of humans in the funnel, but you should also try to get rid of like product friction. These can be things like your sign up process should be really frictionless, you can add things like sign up with Google that uh, removes the friction of like email validation and so on. Um, another kind of friction uh, that we had at Userflow. So actually with Userflow, in order to run our product in, in somebody's app, you need to install a small piece of code. For that, you need developers involved. Um, but the people trialing our product are not developers. They are uh, customer success managers, they're product managers. So what we did was we made a Chrome extension that allows uh, customer success man and, and uh, product managers to experience the full value of our product uh, by building flows and previewing flows with the Chrome extension that then loads this code locally. So they don't need uh, to install the code in their app to experience the value of user flow. Then when they've decided this is valuable for us and they decided to buy, then they can install this JavaScript code in their app. So that's another example of removing friction. So uh, getting the user to a aha moment is really like give people access to your product, either via maybe a freemium or free trial, identify what your aha moment is, build onboarding that guides users towards the aha moment and remove unnecessary friction. So that was more or less it for me here today. Uh, there's a lot of great resources on both onboarding and also product-led growth out there. These are some of the communities that I recommend. The product-led.com community is amazing for product-led growth. Um, and the user onboard is a great page for learning about how different companies do user onboarding. And then this link over here is that I do uh, videos on how we built our entire product-led growth motion at Userflow. So if you go to this link, you can see videos on, on how I explain different areas uh, and how we do it. And then last but not least, uh, you're not uh, kind of, there's so many tools out there for becoming product-led growth today. So don't try to reinvent uh, things. Go out and look for the right tools instead of like trying to build everything yourself. Um, uh, but again, always remember, do things uh, in an iterative way and don't try to buy all these tools at once, but just know that these tools exist to support the product-led journey so you don't have to build stuff uh, customly. So yeah, that's it for me. And uh, I'll now leave it open for any potential uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will now... Let me share my screen.
Um, I have one question. If you allow or yes, allow. Please. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> this is more like a strategic. You talk about uh, three area, areas uh, being the last one, the end user area. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what it leads to product, uh, product growth. Are you expecting a fourth area? What is your vision of, of, of the world? And I, I'm asking this because my belief of what I have seen is not all the products or services fit the product-led needs. And there are cases of companies that went to through that, uh, through that uh, path, and now they are going back to the to 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 the second stage. And I give you an example: uh, ClickView. Mm -hmm. ClickView, as a business intelligence tool, was developed for all the end users create the dashboards. And, and one of the biggest problems of them right now is that companies are looking for centralized information, not decentralized information. So what is your expectations of the future? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think uh, we still have a long way to go in this, uh, in this era. Uh, and I think if you look at the SaaS world today, like, a lot of companies will say they are more product-led, but they aren't really. Um, so like, I think in, in the current state, we still have a long way to go for many companies to become more product-led. Uh, so that's gonna take a while. Um, uh, so what the fourth era will be, it's a really good question. You know, many, many things can impact that, you know, things like um, VR, mobile, all sorts of things, you know, can impact how we use technology in uh, in the future uh, but that's really what you need to look at you need to look at what the kids using today right what are what are the children uh, how are they using technology and that's where things will go right uh, that's really how technology works i think um, so so when you when you look for the future look at what your children are doing uh, with their technology uh, and and then you can prepare for that but I don't think you should be preparing for that. You should rather focus on status quo, which is uh, that, that product-led growth is still very much uh, not something a lot of companies have. But also, how do you, how you combine it? Because in the case of user flow, yeah. uh, as product-led is, 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 uh, is the fundamental base of sales for the company. And in yeah. user flow, for example, you have... Uh, three different uh, uh, sales uh, types, startups, uh, enter, uh, yeah. blah, 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 and oh, enterprise. Yeah. And enterprise yeah. is a whole different story than startups, you know? Yeah, yes and no. I think I'm increasingly seeing enterprises also sending some kind of end user, uh, at least to user flow, like a designer, a product manager, somebody who does an initial trial. Uh, so they try the product, they experience the value and then yes, what comes after that is still a very much like a sales process with, you know, with meetings and contracts and all that stuff, but you can still m drive the product -led motion in the beginning of the sales cycle, right? Funnel, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. what, what exists today, which I think is just, that's a um, kind of more a matter of tradition and rules, which I think we should break. I always think we should break rules is I hear these rules where employees cannot sign up for free trials uh, because their company won't allow them to do that, right? And that's for me old school, right? That's because you still live in that old school world where everybody needs to buy through sales meetings, right? Um, and I think uh, that is that's gonna change as more and more businesses become product-led, those rules are also gonna change for companies looking to buy. Um, so yeah. I think you still see that in, in some enterprises that they kind of block their employees from actually trying software. But also processes, because I see user flow 
without knowing, without having it use it, just like using the seeing the, the website, I see it like a business process management tool. Uh, so there, there is still process, there are processes, certain processes that could fit perfectly in user flow. However, the process per se doesn't allow it. For example, a bank sign off, you know, where you have certain regulations that will not be easy for an employee just to rely on that tool. No, no, and, and that's why I say, if you have those kind of like enterprise rules, that's fine. And that will come as it should, in, in a product world that would come after the initial trial like uh, today, it's very much the other way around, right? Like the whole sales motion is, uh, or traditionally in SaaS, sales-led SaaS, it's been, you start with the sales meeting and then you end up with the product where now you switch it around, where you start with the product trial and then you can discuss all the, the, the these kind of blockers, enterprise blockers later, but they then have a good understanding of the product before having those conversations. It's very interesting because it's, it's a very strong mindset that you need to have, you know? Yeah, I agree. And mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big change. And that's why I talked about a lot about change management today, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because that's really the most important, especially if you're moving from a sales-led to product-led motion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, if someone else have a have another question please feel free to type it in the chat or you can raise your hand and ask directly by voice uh, while we are waiting i have a question as well uh, as you also mentioned now it's important to change the management perspective on uh, how to lead the company and i was wonder do you have any advice on how to do that because sometimes it's not such an easy thing to do to also change your manager or someone on a higher level compare yours if you want to bring that to your own company. So convincing your managers to think more product-led growth. Um, so I think that's why I showed those um, uh, examples of companies that I did today, right? Uh, so feel free to use that. Use the, the OpenView uh, PLG overview most people are very motivated by revenue, right? So if they can see that other companies are very successful with this motion and are driving higher revenue growth, higher value, that is what is going to change their minds into believing in this model, right? Um, so you can use those kind of things as, as kind of the motivation for, for them to listen to you, basically. Thank you. Thank you. That's, thank you for sharing that yes you also participants you will be able to, to also get the slide to youtube later so if you want to use that for your own company you can as well okay yeah. so as the, the crowd today doesn't, doesn't have too many questions i will ask another one uh, i was wondering if in any of your situation you had a kind of uh you made some kind of error that led you to a uh, better situation you are at the moment like in creating also your company user flow if going through this uh, product-led uh, uh, mindset did you had make any mistake that make you realize or and learn even more from then just going to the right direction mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I don't think uh, in Useflow, no, I haven't, uh, we haven't made many mistakes when we, we're moving iteratively. I think in Cobalt, uh, a lot of my learnings around like overscoping and not moving iteratively comes from Cobalt, right? Uh, and, and that is something we learned, like we always, we, you know, it was not like we did uh, all these things from the beginning, we overscoped, we didn't move iteratively, right? So that's, that were learnings as well as the learning that it's a very cross-functional thing. We knew that, but you know, we didn't have the coordination. Uh, we didn't take it serious enough before later on, right? Um, so the, all these change management learnings is something I got out of Cobalt for sure. Thank you so much. Uh, Bennett, you can uh, 
turn your mic on and share your question. Thank you. Um, would you say that 90% or 99% product led are SaaS, B2B SaaS companies? Um, I'm, I'm trying to get my head around. I mean, the, the, the mechanisms are the same for, for B2C uh, services. If you're thinking of a of a modern um, of a modern uh, software thing. I mean, we all, most of us, I assume, do software. Um, but I try to think my head around account about extending that to consumer products or to something. I mean, the only the only product that really B two C thing that comes to my mind would be like Facebook or something, where there is absolutely no, there's absolutely only a free service, and you have a platform that's advertising. Right. I think all B2C businesses are product-led. They can't choose to be anything else. Like, have, to, have you ever had a meeting uh, as a co consumer with a business? Like, I, yes, maybe some still exist like where you, you go to a website and then you are like, you have to call someone, right? Um, yes, that's still a sales-led motion, but the far majority of online B2C businesses are product-led. So I see product-led growth as being the, the move of B2B into this more, uh, what, what has traditionally been B2C, right? Um, honestly. I, I wish I could agree with you, but my, my experience tells me, uh, tells me the, quite the opposite. Um, and now you have to understand that we deal in debt collection and mm -hmm. the self-serving portal for the debtors um, um it's it's not quite product that oh but of course you can't really call them consumers uh, uh, customers because they're kind of forced to deal with us so yeah no as i said i think there are model software models out there where consumers have to still call people and do stuff which but i think if you look at it the far majority of b2c software as a service is self-service right um it's not, it's not uh, that you have to call someone. Um, so so I, I think, yes, there's always exceptions and there still is, but uh, I think B2, the way I think about product like growth is very much like this is around B2B and like trying to think this whole like uh, self-service end user, think a bit more B2C about your B2B business. Um, and if you have a heavily sales-led b2c business then you are in that bucket too where you need to look at businesses that are not like that right uh, that how do they better allow uh, consumers to be self-service basically thank you so much we have a question from the chat from uh, hamad what is the discovery and validation process look like for transitioning to product that grow um, yeah, uh, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question. Um, I think what you can, uh, you, you should have a good idea about it, right? Uh, and I think the, the risk is that you make assumptions that these people are never going to be able to go product led. And I've seen that happen many times. And that's a big risk when you do this kind of discovery. If you ask people, uh, then uh, it's not always they say the truth, right? Like that's uh, that's that's a hard piece of it. So sometimes you just have to believe and take a leap of faith that this can happen. Uh, this can happen. That's how you drive change, right? If all these other businesses are doing it, why shouldn't you be able to do it, right? Um, so I'm always a bit hesitant when people talk about discovery and validation because that's uh, yes. Of course, you should always speak with your customers, but that sounds like in a big company, discovery and validation sounds like something that takes six months to one year. That's not worth it. Just then try to do a, some kind of mini MVP uh, PLG motion to see how to see how it goes uh, instead. Again, reduce scope and iterate. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Juan. Uh, how do you get around the procurement process in big companies? <coughs> sorry, with the self-service product lead product. So uh, I can speak from what we do at Userflow. So first of all, we highly disincentivize uh, buying with contracts and invoices. 
uh, we give a much higher price on enterprise packages than we do on our pro package that is online terms and credit card. Um, so we are highly disincentivizing it um, uh, through price, basically. And then we still allow for it, right? So they can still, uh, if they've done a trial, it's not like, so that's a, a very important thing to, product-led growth doesn't mean that you cannot have people involved at all. You can still have a sales meeting after and so on, or sometimes even before uh, with the customer. And you can go through all these uh, uh, processes of contract negotiation. But I think in a, in a very, like a born product-led business I use for, we're trying to really disincentivize it uh, to price, um, but we still allow it uh, to happen to, 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 for them to do these kind of more expensive uh, procurement processes, but then we also charge for it, basically. Yes, thank you so much. And um, there are any more questions? Okay, so it's, uh... Yes, it's, it's almost time. We we have la last one question. If some of any of you want to still ask you something to Esben, or okay, uh, I will ask the last question. Uh, you share with us some uh, some uh, some link where we can discover more about Product Let Grow. Do you also advise any book, or do you think that yeah, so the productlet.com community they have written two books. Uh, one is called Product Led Growth by Wes Bush. And the latest one uh, is very related to user flow. It's called Product Led Onboarding, uh, which is exactly around how you build onboarding and drives towards this aha moment. And how also that onboarding is a very continuous thing. It's not just when in the initial part of a user's journey, it's also something you continue doing to drive retention. Um, so those two books is what I would recommend. Okay, thank you so much. And also thank you all for joining today's uh, meeting. Uh, thank you also for, yes, it's been a share the link so you can find it easily. Thank you so much for that. And I hope you to see you next week as we will be hosting another event and wish you all a good evening and also thank you for joining us today and thank you Sven. Uh, thank you thank you all ciao thank you.